I'm standing in front of the entrance to Guru Mertam Temple on the outskirts of Tiruvannamalai. When Bhagavan first came to Tiruvannamalai in 1896, he took up residence in the Arunachalaswara Temple in town. Shortly before he came here, he was staying under an ilupai tree in a courtyard in the temple. At that time he was being visited by uh, a Tevaram singer called Anamale Tambaram. The, the Tevarams are songs composed by famous Saiva saints between 12 and 1500 years ago. This Anamale Tambaram used to sing them in public and raise funds for his various projects. He was supporting Bhagavan at that time and his guru was associated with this temple we see behind us. So he used to come here every day and do puja to his guru and distribute food from the puja to anyone who was here. So he suggested to Bhagavan that he come here in 1898 as a way of avoiding the crowds who were pestering him in the temple and he also promised to feed him when he was here. Bhagavan agreed and the 18 months he spent in this particular location are the furthest away from Arunachala that he ever went during his 54 years in Tiruvannamalai. I'm now sitting in the central portion of the Guru Murtam Shrine. Behind me is the lingam of the Guru after, after whom this place is named. There's one small antechamber where I'm sitting right now and further out there's a little hallway supported by granite pillars. Now lingams are installed in the central shrine of all Siva temples and they're also uh, markers of the graves of distinguished saints. So a lingam can either be uh, a representation or a manifestation of Shiva in a form that's worshipable in a temple, or it can also signify the place where a great saint or an enlightened being has passed away. When Bhagavan came here, uh, he was immediately attacked by large numbers of ants. Uh, Anamle Tambiram spotted this and brought a stool for him to sit on before he was sitting on the floor and told Bhagavan he could squat on top of this stool and all of the four legs were in little bowls of water underneath. Somehow Bhagavan either didn't want to or couldn't manage that. He leaned against the wall of the temple and the ants of course used that as a bridge to swarm all over his body and attack his body. But since he was mostly in Samadhi in this temple it didn't seem to bother him. Bhagavan said that he sat in that position for so long that over time there was a mark on the wall and pilgrims from Ramanashrama used to come here over the succeeding decades used to report back to Bhagavan that the mark was still on the wall. B. V. Narasimha Swami who wrote Bhagavan's biography around 1930 he said it was still there when he came but the next account I've come across was in the early 40s after which the temple seems to have had a, a period of disuse. It was being used as a tobacco warehouse. The whole place had been whitewashed and there was no trace of the mark that Bhagavan had left. So I'm not quite sure where it is. Uh, I'm guessing it's in the first of the three rooms as we come into the temple. Now Bhagavan was in a shockingly neglected state when he lived here. Um, he'd had one bath in Tiruvannamalai in 1896 when somebody forcibly scrubbed him. Two years down the line he hadn't bathed, he hadn't shaved, his hair had grown, it was all thick and matted, his fingernails had grown and even by his own admission he stank. So here we have a, a teenage boy, probably 18 years old, completely oblivious to his body, to the world, sitting in the shrine, leaning, leaning against a wall which gave access to all the ants that were swarming all over his body. I just want to uh, read a couple of accounts. Bhagavan commented on his neglected physical condition in a couple of comments he made many decades later. A lady by name Minachi, who used to now and then bring food to me, one day brought a large pot. I thought it was some, something for herself. She said, Swami, Swami, please come. I did not move, but she wouldn't leave me alone. She pulled me up by the arm, made me sit, smeared the oil, the oil all over my body and then bathed me. 
The hair on the head, which had got matted for want of care, was now spread out and hung down like the mane of a lion. The problem of the long matted hair was solved by another lady who appeared and probably forcibly shaved Bhagavan. This is how Bhagavan described this event. My hair had got matted and woven like a basket. Small stones and dust had settled down in it and the head used to feel heavy all the time. I also had long nails and a frightful appearance. So people pressed me to have a shave. Somehow I yielded. When my head was shaved clean, I began to wonder whether I had a head or not. It felt so light. I shook my head this way and that to assure myself it was still there. That showed the amount of burden I'd been carrying on my head. Namo Ramana Yanalam Peravarna Vimochanami when Bhagavan lived in the Arunachala Swara temple shortly before he came here, his food needs were being met by two people. Anamali Tambiran, the one who persuaded him to come here, and Udandi Nayanar, who was his first regular attendant. After Anamali Tambiran persuaded him to come here, because this was the place he came every day to worship the lingam of his guru, he offered food to the image every day, and some of it was returned to Bhagavan as prasad. Bhagavan lived on this for a while. One of the ladies who used to look after Bhagavan in the main temple also continued to supply food, but Bhagavan persuaded her to stop sending because it was too inconvenient for her to make food and bring it out here. So Anamale Tambiran had uh, promised that Bhagavan that he would feed him while he was here, but he was unavoidably called away after some time. So he went back to Udandi Nayanar, the original attendant, and said, you must feed Bhagavan, uh, I have to go out of town. Unfortunately, Udandi Nayanar also left town, and that left Bhagavan without an attendant, and also at the mercy of all the people he had been trying to avoid in the main temple who wanted to feed him. Uh, devotees would come every day, they'd make offerings, they'd force him to eat some, and mostly Bhagavan would try to refuse. So I just want to uh, tell one story about a lady called Minakshi Amma, who Bhagavan called a Rakshasi. A Rakshasi is, uh, in most Indian languages, the word for demon or devil. And so for Bhagavan to use such a strong word for someone who was, in a well-meaning way, trying to help me, must have been she was pretty, uh, pretty bossy. So Bhagavan said she moved in after his first two attendants left. Uh, she would go around the hill every day, she would collect food in town, cook it, bring it here, and force Bhagavan to eat it. Uh, Bhagavan didn't really want to be controlled by this lady, but he said, what, what to do? This is, this is life as a Swami. You don't know how much trouble being a Swami involves. Eventually, after I left Guru Murtim, it was to avoid people like this who felt that they owned me or that I should have obligations towards them, because uh, they were supplying me with food. Although Bhagavan was receiving food from Minakshi and from several other people who were trying to serve him, he didn't have a lot of interest in food. He was in a kind of unconscious samadhi state for much of the time. So, so much so that his body wasted away. Uh, I want to read uh, three separate comments that Bhagavan made about his time in this temple. Uh, most, of, most of the portion I'm reading out, I actually found in a manuscript in the Sri Ramanashram archives about 30 years ago. It had remained unpublished. And in it, Bhagavan, Bhagavan gave a very telling and revealing account of just how weak, just how feeble, and just how completely oblivious to the world he actually was in those days. I can tell you, Swamihood is very difficult. You cannot realize it. I'm speaking from 50 years' experience. After my experiences at Guru Murtam, I wanted to avoid it by not remaining in any one place for any length of time. You should have seen me at Guru Murtam. I was only skin and bone, no flesh anywhere. All the bones were sticking out, collarbone, ribs, hip bones. There was no stomach to be seen. It was sticking to the back, having receded so far. At Guru Murtam, I was very much constipated. I would just sit there and after some time try to rise. I would raise myself from my haunches and at once feel faint and giddy 
and resume my old position. Sometime later I would endeavour to get up, raise myself a foot or so, then feel the same reeling sensation and sit down again. On one occasion after such failures I got up and tried to go out and was clutching at the front door. When Palanaswami, his attendant, came and held me in his arms, I turned to him and wished to know through silence why he was behaving in this manner. He said that he had noticed that I was about to fall and so he seized me to prevent. But I was holding on to the door with both hands outstretched and was not aware that I was about to fall. This difficulty in getting up on account of reeling was a constant feature of my life at Guru Murtam. Days and nights would pass without my being aware of their passing. I entertained no idea of bathing, cleaning my teeth or other cleansing when I defecated. My face got begrimed, the hair became one clotted mass like wax and the nails grew long. When anyone thought that I should take food and called, I would stretch a hand. Something would drop on it and I would eat and then rub my hand on my head or body and then drop again into the continuous mood of samadhi. Sometimes people would pull out my hand and place food on it and I would swallow it. This was my condition for many years from the time of my arrival. For many years I only ate off my hand without using any leaf plate. When I was at Guru Merton my nails grew about an inch long and I had long flowing matted hair. I could hear people whispering outside saying I was hundreds of years old. They thought I'd been in that state for centuries. Now, Bhagavan also remarked that when he went up to Skandashram, the people who had come to see him here, thinking he was a great yogi, hundreds of years old, deeply absorbed in his tapas, were a bit disappointed. And they would say to him, Swami, give us darshan in the form you used to have at Guru Murtam. They, they all thought that somehow he'd been spoiled and he was living a family household life at Skandashram. And they, want, they wanted a god who was sitting all day in Samadhi to worship, and Bhagavan unfortunately wasn't obliging them in those days. After the chaos of Bhagavan's early days here when his two attendants disappeared in different directions and uh, the, Raksh the Rakshasi Minakshi was trying to boss him around and tell him what to eat, Bhagavan was ultimately saved by the arrival of a man called Palaniswami. Palaniswami was uh, a Kerala man who was much older than he was. He uh, was worshipping a Ganesh image in the main town. And some, somebody said, why are you spending your time worshipping this stone image? If you really want to earn some merit, there's a real living God staying in Guru Merton temple. Go see if you like him. If you like him, then if you serve that man, you'll get immeasurable benefits from your service. Palanaswami came here somewhere around 1898, uh, took one look at Bhagavan, fell in love with him, and from that moment on he and Bhagavan were almost inseparable for about 18 years. Palanaswami became Bhagavan's principal attendant. He was the person uh, who mediated access to Bhagavan. He was the person who took all the food offerings, and he just made sure that Bhagavan was left undisturbed and that received proper attention whenever Bhagavan was willing to accept it. I'm now standing outside Guru Murtam temple on its northwestern corner and I'm here because after a stay of about 18 months inside Bhagavan was persuaded to move out to an adjoining mango orchard. The orchard has long since gone, there are no photographic records of it, but uh, tradition at Ramanashram locates it about a hundred yards to the northwest of the temple, and that's approximately the direction I'm walking in right now. Now, I'm not quite sure why Bhagavan felt security was poor inside the temple, but the person who owned an orchard nearby uh, said, if you move into my mango orchard, nobody will be able to see you without the permission of my watchman who's there all the time. There was a fence around the orchard, there was a gate, and there was a person stationed at the gate. So Bhagavan accepted this invitation, and he and Palanaswami, who was now his full-time attendant, moved inside, and they made themselves two primitive little raised platforms out of bamboo under a mango tree, and they both sat there quite happily. 
Although it sounds very primitive, Bhagavan had very fond memories of living here. And this, this is what he had to say about uh, 50 years later when he was telling the story of how he and Palanaswami camped out. I was in the mango grove next to Guru Murtam for some time. At that time I had a small shed under a mango tree. They erected something overhead like a nest to prevent rain falling on top of me. There was, however, not enough space even to stretch my legs while fully sleeping. I used to be sitting almost all the time like a bird in its nest. Opposite my shed, Palaniswami also had a little shed. In that huge garden, only two of us used to stay. The mango tree also had, full, had small fruits. During the season, they used to drop on top of my shed now and then, creating a sound like top, top. Even though they got ripe, the outer cover was green. After they were sufficiently ripe, they used to be plucked and kept in storage until fully ripe. In the meantime, bats used to come in the night, nibble at all the ripe mangoes, eat a, be eat, eat a bit of each and throw it down. The balance fell to our lot. It was a kind of prasad from the bat. Although the gardener used to tell us to take the fruit from the trees whenever we felt like it, we never touched them. We had the prasad from the bat. When they got fully ripe on the tree itself, they were delicious. Is that not enough? Those thatched sheds, that nature's beauty, they gave us both immense joy. Now there's one slightly less joyful story that Bhagavan mentioned a couple of times. He was sitting in Guru Murtam when a group of thieves came in order to steal tamarind fruit from tamarind trees which must have been here as well. They saw Bhagavan and they didn't want him to be a witness to their theft and they thought if they blinded him by rubbing the juice of a poisonous plant into his eyes then he wouldn't be able to identify them at a later date. Bhagavan said he just sat there completely immobile listening to the discussion of the tamarind thieves saying let's get some of this juice, let's rub it in that Swami's eye, let's blind him so he won't know who we are. And Bhagavan said he had no compulsion to move, no compulsion to react, he just sat there listening to the thieves, planning to maim him. And then finally one of them said, no, let's leave him alone, he's harmless. And they went ahead and they robbed, robbed the tamarind trees and left Bhagavan in peace. Namo when Anamle Tambaram first brought Bhagavan to the Guru Murtam shrine, he offered him food and then Shortly afterwards, he tried to do a puja to Bhagavan. Now, all of his life, Bhagavan objected to people trying to do formal ritual worship to him. So he, even though he was in a state of samadhi most of the day, this irritated him so much, he stirred himself, uh, found a piece of charcoal and wrote on the wall inside Guru Murtam temple, this alone is enough for this. Now that is a rather elliptical sentence but the meaning was, this food which you're offering to me is enough for this body which you are serving. So although it wasn't spelled out properly, Tambiram Swami, sorry, Arnamale Tambiram realized that Bhagavan didn't want a puja, uh, and this charcoal mark on the wall, Bhagavan said it stayed there for many decades, and he told a visitor who came to see him about 40 years later, if you if you chip the whitewash off in the right place, you might find my message still scrawled on the wall. I, uh, I suggested to Raman Ashram they might off offer to do a repainting inside the shrine and scrape off all the old whitewash and see if Bhagavan's original sign is in there, but they weren't very enthusiastic. Now, this charcoal writing on the wall was the first indication that Bhagavan knew how to read and write. He wasn't speaking, but his ability to write gave an option to find out more about him. So somebody lobbied him quite intensively to write on a piece of paper what his name was and where he came from. Bhagavan initially refused, but the man pestered him so effectively that finally Bhagavan gave up and wrote his name, Benkata Ramana, and afterwards he wrote Tiruchuli, which was the small town where he was born. The person who had asked him to write this didn't know where Tiruchuli was, so Bhagavan picked up a copy of the Periya Puranam, which was lying around in the temple. The, the Periya Puranam is 
an anthology of the biographies of 63 Tamil saints. It's one of the very few spiritual books that Bhagavan read before he came here. Tiruchuli is mentioned in that book because when one of the saints whose stories is told in that book travelled around Tamil Nadu, he went to Tiruchuli. So Bhagavan opened the book at the right page and pointed out where Tiruchuli was mentioned in Periopuranam. So at that point, people knew what his name was and they knew what his place of birth was. Now this was a major development for Anamale Tambiran. He went off to stay in a Saiva monastery some distance away and while he, while he was there he happened to mention that there was a great saint in Tiruvannamale and that he was in late teens and that his original birthplace was Tiruchuli. Now word of this trickled back to Majurai where Bhagavan's family were and they thought this must be the missing boy who ran away from our house. So an expedition was started to come to, come to see this saint in Tiruvannamale and establish whether or not it was their runaway son. The person who was delegated to do this was a man called Neliapa Ayer, who was Bhagavan's uncle. So he arrived with one other family member and got as far as the entrance to the mango orchard, which is probably somewhere where I'm sitting right now. At that time, the watchman was on duty and wouldn't let them in. He was doing his job very efficiently. So, Neliapa I said, but, I, but I'm his uncle, just go and tell Bhagavan, go and tell Venkataramana I'm his uncle and ask if he'll see me. No, uh, no go. So Neliapa I decided the only way to get access was to write a note which the watchman of the mango orchard would then take in and show to Bhagavan inside. Now this, this is a part of the story I like. Um, he hadn't come equipped with either a pen or a piece of paper. No, he had a piece of paper, but he didn't have a pen. So he constructed himself uh, a nib and a pen out of a twig from a tree and he dipped it into the juice of a fruit called prickly pear. Prickly pear is a, a fruit with red juice that grows on a cactus that's wild all over this place. And I know from stories that Bhagavan told that in addition to the mangoes inside there was also a lot of prickly pears and that Palanaswami used to go and collect food from the local village and bring it back and Bhagavan said he had to dodge in and out of these prickly pear plants in order to reach the place where Bhagavan was hiding in the mango orchard. So a piece of paper was produced and it was office stationery from another member of Bhagavan's family which he happened to have in his pocket and on the back it said uh, Neliapa Aya uh, Pleader. Pleader is a kind of low-grade lawyer. Uh, Pleader from Majurai would like to see you. So this note was taken in Bhagavan studied it, he turned it over and saw that the paper was on official stationery of the registration office and he realised that his elder brother Nagaswami had taken a job there and he also recognised his uncle's handwriting. Now this is interesting because although it was very difficult for anyone to communicate with Bhagavan, his faculties were still there, they were still functioning properly. In later years, he would tell stories of conversations he'd overheard, people talking about him from outside the temple. And he had a, a, a functioning intellect that was capable of looking at this piece of paper, ascertaining from it that one brother had taken a job in one particular government department and he recognised his uncle's handwriting on the other. So although most of the time he was absorbed in the inner bliss, the inner silence of the self, there was at the same time a kind of observational faculty and acuity which was there even though he couldn't express himself either through speech or except very rarely through writing. He let his uncle in, he said okay let him in, he's my uncle or signalled this, he wasn't speaking and the uncle came in, uh, confirmed that the boy in front of him was his nephew and wasn't quite sure what to make of him. He, he realised he was in the presence of a great ascetic and he wasn't sure whether he should worship him or feel sorry for him. Uh, in the end he'd just come for confirmation. He went back to Majurai and told the family, that's our boy, he's living in this temple. And the family had to accept the fact that this was their boy, that he'd run away and he wasn't really interested in coming back. Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna 
I mentioned earlier that Bhagavan's intellect, his powers of observation were still functioning perfectly normally inside this neglected body. And proof of this comes from the latter part of his stay here, when his attendant Palanaswami was passing away some of the day by attempting to read philosophy books and learn about the basics of the Hindu philosophical tradition. Now he was a Malayali by birth, Tamil wasn't his native language, and Tamil literary texts are written in a very uh, arcane literary form, which isn't the form that you do your shopping with, it's, it's a, a highly stylized form, and he had difficulty in getting through the books. He was borrowing them from the library of a man called Nagalinga Swami who died, and the books were available to be borrowed. He would bring them to Guru Murtam, and Bhagavan could see that he was having difficulty in uh, reading the texts, understanding them, getting the essence out. So Bhagavan himself would take these books, which were written in uh, classical Tamil, uh, Kaivalya Navanitam, Vaishishtam, books like this, which are, which are quite complicated to read. Uh, I must say here that Bhagavan had a natural talent for literary Tamil, and that one story I've heard was that at school it was the only subject that he had a natural affinity for, and at the age of 13 he was correcting his Tamil teacher. Every other subject he was as lazy as he could get away with being, but somehow literary Tamil was something that he had a talent for, a fascination for, and he'd mastered the essence of Tamil literary texts by the time he dropped out at the age of 16. So two years later, when Palanaswami was having trouble reading these very complicated texts, Bhagavan would pick them up, go through them, and possibly explain, um, or make, make the essence understood to Palanaswami. He wasn't speaking at this time. How he was doing it, I'm not sure, but Bhagavan said that he took these books up and he helped Palanaswami to understand what was in them. Now, Bhagavan had an extraordinary memory. Uh, this was a period of his life when he absorbed the whole Tamil Advaita Vedantic tradition through the books that Palanaswami was borrowing. And then 50 years into the future, you could ask him a question, and somehow those texts were fixed in his brain. In, in later years, he wasn't reading them so much, but somehow he managed to assimilate an inner library that stayed with him for the rest of his life from the year or so that he and Palanaswami were here reading these books together. Now, there's one Palanaswami story that I must add to this, although it's not actually taking place here. When they moved up the hill to Virupaksha Cave around 1902, people started to come, and the tradition in those days would be that devotees would beg for their food in town, the various uh, collected food would be brought out, Bhagavan would uh, mix it all together, divide it out, and everybody would get an equal portion of whatever food had been begged that day. Now, Palaniswami came from a particular community in Kerala, where it was uh, compulsory to read a chapter of a, of a work called Adyat, Adyatma Ramayana. It was the, a Kerala version of the Ramayana story. Uh, but he wasn't very good at reading it out. The text was written in Malayalam, which was Palanaswami's native language. So he would stumble through this chapter every day, uh, and the length of time it took him to read a chapter was irritating all the people who were waiting for their food because Bhagavan wouldn't eat anything until the chapter was over, and none of the other devotees was allowed to touch their food until Bhagavan had taken his first bite. So Bhagavan could see that this wasn't, uh, wasn't pleasing all the people who were waiting for their dinner, so he went up to Palaniswami and said, does, does it matter who reads this book? Do you have to read it yourself, or can anybody read it? And Palaniswami said, no, no, the tradition is somebody has to read one chapter of this book before we eat. So Bhagavan said, OK, teach me the Malayalam script, uh, and then I, I, can, I can learn it, and I can read the chapter. Nobody will complain about me, and then we can all eat after I've read the chapter. So Bhagavan said he discovered that Malay Malayalam, the language of Kerala, had a mixture of 
uh, Tamil and Granta characters. The script wasn't that complicated and the language itself was kind of related to Tamil. But it, even so, uh, Bhagavan picked it up uh, extraordinarily quickly. Uh, when Kanji Swami told this story, he said that within three days he'd mastered the script and that within a week Bhagavan was doing the daily readings of this very complex Malayalam text before the evening meal. Now just as a final addendum to this, Bhagavan picked up languages very easily. Uh, in the same way that he absorbed texts, uh, philosophical ideas, somehow languages came very easily. He was brought up speaking Tamil at home. He had a Telugu uncle. Telugu is the language of what is now Andhra Pradesh, the next state north. So he spoke Telugu quite well. He learned Malayalam when Palana Swami was having trouble reading this text. So the three principal uh, colloquial languages of South India he mastered and he could have very complex philosophical arguments, um, dialogues in any of those three languages if you came from the regions where they were spoken. He also picked up Sanskrit. Uh, I have absolutely no idea how or when he learned Sanskrit, but he learned it well enough that in the 1920s he was writing quite good Sanskrit poetry. In fact, he wrote uh, Malayali poetry, he wrote Tamil poetry, he wrote Telugu poetry, and he even wrote Sanskrit poetry. Although his English, uh, which was probably the fourth or fifth language that he learned to speak well, was quite sufficient to correct his own interpreter in the hall, if somebody asked a question and it wasn't translated properly, he'd say, no, that's not what the person said. And he, he would answer in Tamil. He very, very rarely gave an answer in English. Somehow he didn't feel comfortable giving complicated philosophical answers in English. He could ask you how you were, stuff like that. But if you wanted a philosophical answer in English, he would always send for an interpreter. And I never quite understood that because I when I looked after the ashram archives, went through texts in English that Bhagavan himself had proofread and written corrections in the margin. And his knowledge of style, his knowledge of written English was a lot better than the people who were compiling the books. And his suggestions were always improving the text. So this, this for me is just a little oddity that while he was happy to talk Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, write poems in all three languages plus Sanskrit, English, he was a little more reserved about, and he always insisted on having some help with his answers. Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna Vimochana Meyan Virai Malattarvarna Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna Vimochana Meyan Virai Malattarvarna Namuramanayanalam Pedavar, 